So this is the main thing I wanted to get into here. The drug dosages of the DGV weightlifters were very high, sometimes exceeding in the upper weight categories, 10 grams per What's up guys, Derek, moreplacemoredays.com. Today we're gonna to be talking about the, the secret Turinabal cycle run by the German Democratic Republic government in their uh, you know, like secret programs and the dosages that were given to their athletes and um, exactly what went into this you know, like behind the scenes protocol that essentially got buried and was uncovered um, at a later date. So in this uh, volume 43, issue seven of clinical chemistry, <laughs> the abstract is several classified documents saved after the collapse of the German Democratic Republic in 1990 describe the promotion by the government of the use of drugs, notably androgenic steroids in high performance sports, doping, top secret doctoral theses, scientific reports, progress reports of grants, proceedings from symposia of experts and reports of physicians and scientists who served as unofficial collaborators for the ministry for state security reveal that from 1966 on hundreds of physicians and scientists including top-ranking professors performed doping research and administered prescription drugs as well as unimproved experimental drug preparations several thousand athletes were treated with androgens every year including minors of each sex Special emphasis was placed on administering androgens to women and adolescent girls because this practice proved to be particularly effective for sports performance. Damaging side effects were recorded, some of which required surgical or medical intervention. In addition, several prominent scientists and sports physicians of the GDR contributed to the development of methods of drug administration that would evade detection by international doping controls. So you go down here and kind of goes through the uh, introduction to performance enhancement in sport and kind of, uh, you know, athletes and coaches deny publicly and tenaciously the use of these drugs. Blah, blah, blah. Obviously, they're not going to admit something that could tarnish their reputation. Um, documentation of the GDR government's doping system. So all documents of the governmentally organized and controlled hormonal doping in the GDR sports system were classified and accessible only to selected persons the security was controlled by the ministry for state security after the political turn in late 1989 some information about a systematic doping system in the gdr although undocumented leaked to the western press at the same time some of the officials of the gdr sports system apparently took care to assure that all compromising documents were either destroyed or collected by the sports medical service many documents quote unquote, disappeared from official libraries, including several doctoral theses. Some documents were saved, however, particularly those stored at the Medical Academy of the National People's Army in Bad Sorrow, probably pronouncing that wrong, east of Berlin. We, the authors of this article, succeeded in acquiring several of the secret doctoral theses that report the result of the effects, side effects, and damages observed during controlled administration of steroids and peptide hormones to students world-class athletes and minors also found were a series of scientific reports from the FKS and the research centers of the various sports associations and a handwritten protocol book giving the times and dosages of administration of anabolic androgenic steroids to hundreds of male and female athletes. In addition, the deputy director and chief physician of the SMD and the GDR doping system himself sold some of the most incriminating documents to the weekly magazine Stern in uh, 1990. Furthermore, since 1994, highly classified reports have been found that identify MDs and PhDs of the GDR sports system who acted as unofficial collaborators with the MFS and security police. Stasi, in this capacity, they regularly reported problems, notably those related to international sports affairs, the doping system, and possible signs of impending defection of persons from the GDR. These Stasi reports probably pronouncing that wrong, some of which cover greater than 30 years and a thousand pages. Like other Stasi reports include examples in which a friend spies on a friend, a coach on his athletes, a physician on his patients, or even a husband on his wife. Some also spied on their colleagues in other countries. Altogether, over 150 documents have been discovered that deal with systematic doping in the GDR sports system. These documents provide detailed information 
Like I said, types of drugs, times of administration, and of pre-competition withdrawal, annual and daily dosages, damaging side effects to specific athletes of the specific doping, drug programs of greater than 400 individual athletes. We have documented this evidence in several recent publications, including an expert report published by the something I won't try to pronounce. Some of these classified documents of the GDR doping and doping research are referenced here. So obviously I'm not going to go into every single one of them, but I'm going to kind of get an overarching uh, perspective on some of these uh, <laughs> protocols for you guys. And the main one that most people are interested in is the secret T-ball <laughs> protocols that were prescribed in the 60s and the 70s. So in the 1960s, the GDR was a relatively obscure country with a Cold War image and dominated by the Iron Curtain surrounding it. GDR politicians soon discerned that athletic performance would be one of the fastest and cheapest means of obtaining international prestige for a country with a population of only 17 million. Great efforts were made to improve athletic success from a systematic selection of talented children for special sports to the systematic use of of illegal drugs. All of these efforts were organized efficiently and with totalitarian security measures. Success was real and obvious. From 1972 on, the small GDR was consistently in the top ranks of the medal counts along with the US and Soviet Union. Most of these medals were won with the help of banned drugs used for performance enhancement. Oral Turinable, the androgenic anabolic steroid produced by the state-owned pharmaceutical company VEB Genopharm, Gena Thuringia GDR, probably pronouncing that wrong, was the compound most frequently used. So T-ball, the most frequently used performance enhancing drug. This steroid, a chlor substituted version of methandrostenolone, if you don't know what methandrostenolone is, it is D-ball, had been introduced for clinical use in 1965. By 1966, it was already being abused and administered to male athletes in the GDR sports system to enhance muscle strength, aggressiveness, and performance. So how it differs from methandrostenolone in particular, it's not a potent substrate for aromatase. It's very dry, produces high levels of force, force production with relatively lower increases in body weight. So if you've ever researched uh, D-ball or used it yourself, you'll note that it is accompanied by a pretty drastic increase in temporary weight, a lot of that being water. And this is largely dictated by its interaction with aromatase Terinabol being a more refined agent and something that can be um, leveraged in a sports context more effectively due to the relative lack of increase in body weight in proportion to the increase in force production that it produces. So basically large increases in strength without cranking your body weight up and which would otherwise be something that may be not advantageous if you're in a certain weight class or if you're an athlete that doesn't want to uh, consume too much energy in terms of the more weight on your frame, the more taxing it is on your endurance cardiovascularly. So, you know, T-ball is also more refined and um, less primitive in that it is easier to circumvent testing with something that is more refined and hasn't been, uh, you know, figured out how to test for yet. So that isn't the only reason behind its use, obviously, but it is a very refined agent from the testosterone derivative category of compounds. The results of the administration of oral T-ball to male and female athletes during the 1968 to 1972 Olympic cycle were systematically evaluated in various kinds of events. One of the most important documents, a 1973 secret report by prominent doctors and coaches on the on-off analysis of drug effects in the shot put and throwing events in athletics showed the drug-induced enhancement of performance for 40 world-class athletes. Figure 1 presents a spectacular example, the drug effects on a woman shot putter and shows how her performance was reproducibly increased by roughly 2 meters after daily intake of 2 10 milligram tablets of T-ball for only 11 weeks. Similarly marked effects were reported for other athletes, particularly women, and starting in 1969, this effect was further enhanced by the administration of increasingly higher doses of the drug discontinuously in cycles of a few weeks each. In their report, these authors also introduced new terminology to code the substances they used. They propose henceforth to refer to these drugs as something I won't even attempt to say, i.e. supporting means. Stating under UM, the word I'll not be able to say, we refer ex exclusively to anabolic steroids. The use of the drug rapidly spread to other kinds of sports, and according to Hopner, 
many if not all medal winning GDR athletes in strength and speed dependent events at the Olympic Games of 1979 in Munich had been treated with oral turinabol. So one of the other reasons they probably use T-ball in my opinion, despite you know all the things I mentioned already, is that it's also far more, like I said, it's very refined. It's a lot more tissue selective on paper than D-ball. So D-ball is a very primitive agent that's used for androgen replacement in males. And despite it being prescribed for women in this time frame. Um, it produced androgenic side effects, a lower dosage relative to the anabolism than would otherwise be achieved with a more tissue selective T-ball. So that's why T-ball, you know, on paper, the anabolic to androgenic rating is so superior. In practical application, it isn't as good as it looks on paper, but it certainly is, um, you know, better than D-ball in terms of uh, androgenicity context, milligram for milligram. And this is why, uh, you know, there was a very low threshold for achieving androgen replacement at a therapeutic amount for HRT in men with D-ball. So T-ball, on the other hand, is a lot more tolerable and produces probably more effective outcomes for the majority of these sporting events. So the effects of the treatment with androgenic hormones were so spectacular, particularly in female athletes in strength-dependent events, that few competitors not using the drugs had a chance of winning. In the GDR of the 1970s, the use of this and other androgenic hormones became customary among athletes, including minors. For a talented female athlete, it was a no-win situation. They could either take it, the drug, or leave it, give up competitive sports. So you basically either had to sauce or you'd have to get the fuck out. The dosages were also drastically increased, at least until the late 70s when some of the damaging side effects became so overt that in the swimming events of the Olympic Games in Montreal 1976, where the GDR won 11 out of 13 events, journalists were inquiring about the strangely deep-sounding voices of the broad-shouldered GDR female swimmers. In a summary report to the Stasi on March 3, 1977, SMD de Deputy Director Hopner described the GDR results and concluded, at present, anabolic steroids are applied in all Olympic sporting events with the exception of sailing and gymnastics in females and by all national teams. The application takes place according to approved basic plans in which special situations of individual athletes are also considered. The positive value of anabolic steroids for the development of a top performance is undoubted. Here are a few examples. Performances could be improved with the support of these drugs within four years as follows. Shot put, men, 2.5 to 4 meters. Shot put women, 4.5 to 5 meters. Discus throw men, 10 to 12 meters. Discus throw women, 11 to 20 meters. Hammer throw, 6 to 10 meters. Javelin throw women, 8 to 15 meters. 400 meter women, 4 to 5 seconds. 800 meter women, 5 to 10 seconds. 1500 meter women, 7 to 10 seconds. Remarkable rates of increase in performances were also noted in the swimming events of women from our experiences Made so far, it can be concluded that women have the greatest advantage from treatments with anabolic hormones with respect to their performance in sports, especially high is the performance supporting effect following the first administration of anabolic hormones, especially especially with junior athletes. Now, why does it work better in women? Like I would speculate it's more so because the endogenous androgen production of males is already fulfilling a significant amount of androgen receptor and satellite receptor activation, allowing them to achieve significantly higher um, performance in sport just with baseline endogenous hormone production. Whereas with women, they have such a lower production of endogenous androgens that when you apply a super physiological amount, it just has such a more profound difference on their performance because they've been operating with one tenth the endogenous androgen profile of a man for their entire lives. And now you're pushing them to an anabolic hormone profile exceeding that of a, you know, male, like at natural, like high genetic specimen male. So just like with men, to increase your hormone levels like tenfold is a bit of a less drastic jump than like you have to use way more drug to achieve that than a woman would due to just her baseline endogenous, you know, hormone production state. Since the early 70s, many athletes of the GDR, GDR, notably females, were given not only oral androgenic steroids, but also injections with androgenic hormones, including nandrolone esters or more frequently testosterone esters. The strong viralizing side effects of injectable testosterone esters were accepted by most female athletes, but some refused to participate in this additional testosterone injection program. Moreover, several other classes of do doping drugs from stimulants like amphetamines or oxytocin were also used. A list of the doping substances described as having been used in GDR sports is given in table one. So we look at the table and we have oral T-ball, 
we have uh, Mistanalone, we have, let's see, Debol, we have Test Prop, we have Test E, we have Nandrolone Phenylpropanate, we have De Deca, we have HCG even, we have Amphetamines, we have Methamphetamine, we have Paracetam, wow, um, HGH, interesting. 25 milligrams of testosterone propionate and 1,000 IUs of HCG per milliliter. This is interesting. Major doping substances used in high-performance sport of the GDR. The androgenic changes in phenotype were obvious in 1968 at the Olympic Games in Mexico City, and one of us, uh, BB, a finalist in the discus throw there, later described in several articles, the imminent threat of androgenization to women's sport and proposed out of competition control by analyzing athletes urine with gas chromatography for international discussion see also blah 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 blah. this alarming prediction and the proposed solution were met with hostile silence and were not adopted for almost two decades so basically it goes on to outline how uh you know testing was averted and you know documents were destroyed and blah 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 the most interesting thing i wanted to get into here aside from the uh introduction to t-ball and the usage in women and whatnot is uh the dosages used in the dgv so this is the deutscher gewicht the i'm never gonna say it right the dgv so in the dgv a first agreement is obtained by the head coach the special coaches and the team physician as to which athlete should receive um so if you remember this this was code for the steroids a detailed conception for drug administration is then worked out by the team physician in a written form and sent via the classified document office of the fks to dr hopner and the classified document office of the smd of the gdr from the central smd office in berlin the individual sports Medical district advisory offices of the SMD in the individual counties are informed of which athletes shall participate in the drug program. A selected sports doctor is then nominated as the responsible MD for all doping drug problems in each of these county offices. This central county office doctor will inform the corresponding doctors in the sports clubs and sports associations about the decision concerning the drug administration to a specific athlete and will swear them to absolute secrecy. When information is given by telephone, the doctors talk in coded terms. In the DGV, the UM drugs are usually called vitamins. The sports doctors will swear the athletes and the coaches to secrecy, and this will be recorded in special secrecy books for classified information. The sports doctors will then hand out the weekly doses to the specific coach who in turn will give the drugs to the athlete. This conception is controlled at all levels by random checks of the amount of drugs distributed, consumed, and left over. In the DGV, the athletes usually know that the drugs they are receiving are anabolic steroids. Here, the special problem exists that so many athletes, i.e. all members of the cadres A, B, and C, are part of the anabolic steroid program so that secrecy leaks could occur. So this is the main thing I wanted to get into here. The drug dosages of the DGV weightlifters were very high, sometimes exceeding in the upper weight categories, 10 grams per year. In 1970, keep in mind, it's 10 grams per year, not per week. In 1979, for example, one GDR weightlifter, I don't know why they always put their dosages. In, like Some of these studies are so weird. It's like per drug cycle or per year, like the total amount. In 1979, for example, one GDR weightlifter took 11.55 grams of oral t-ball plus 13 injections of testosterone esters and hcg altogether the specific drug consumption of 400 gdr athletes is now well documented including numerous world record holders and medal winners at olympic games and world and european championships these athletes included most gdr gold medal winners in the swimming events since the 1976 olympic games and all gdr gold medal winners in the throwing events of the 1988 games so the 11.55 grams of t-ball in a year so 1979 and plus 13 injections of testosterone esters. So that's obviously less notable. Like how much test can you do in 13 shots throughout a year? Like that's not very much. The 11.55 grams of T-ball though, if you actually calculate that out. So 11.55 grams equals 11,550 milligrams in a year. So that is about 30 milligrams of T-ball per day. So taking an oral steroid, 30 milligrams of pharma grade T-ball, for an entire year straight plus 13 injections of test honestly that's not that high if you really think about it like i guess there's a lot of you know organ stress that may come along with that but you would expect more frankly like for this being an example of like the peak of abuse in 1979 like i would be thinking much more than 
like 13 shots of test. So if we had 13 injections of testosterone, even if you maxed out the barrel, let's just assume you're using a 3cc syringe, um, so you can fit in, let's just say, 3ccs of, you know, 250 milligram per milliliter test, assuming you're even maxing it out to begin with, which they probably weren't, but you can fit 750 milligrams, approximately, give or take, into a syringe. We do 13 shots of those, so we're looking at about... 13 times 750, we're looking at 9,750 milligrams of testosterone in a year. And if you divide that by 52 weeks, you're only looking at 187.5 milligrams per week, which is, um, and obviously that's not even, you know, stable levels. Like you're going to have massive spikes and then massive crashes based on the lack of administration frequency. Like you're looking at like one shot a month of like some potential, not even a big dose of test potentially. Like even if they max it out, you're looking at at most 187.5 per week if you averaged it out, but it was more likely, even if they maxed it out, 750 like once a month, which is, you know, obviously suboptimal and obviously not uh, that ideal for performance. So we're looking at like a generous HRT amount with 30 milligrams of T-ball per day, which is really a pretty mild cycle by most people's standards who are in performance enhancement. But honestly, the rest of this is very interesting. They go into the use of uh, mistanolone, which is essentially just methyl DHT. And some of these compound choices and some of the dosages are kind of interesting, but you know, this is a good read, and I definitely recommend you guys uh, check it out. It goes into um, the 70s, testosterone esters and steroid bridging, what happened after using the cycles, you know, what happened when people, uh, doping tests were sort of introduced and the outcomes and sort of the eventual, uh, the outcome of the GDR and the testosterone to epitestosterone ratio. I've talked about this before in my Justin Gatlin video. I highly recommend you check that out if you haven't. And how uh, Olympic athletes have been circumventing testing, especially in 100 meter sprinting. I thought it was, uh, I kind of gave a deep dive into that event in particular and the choices of compounds used. And I recommend you check that out if you haven't. And uh, some of this stuff is really interesting. And all of the uh, hyperlinks go to other you know, articles that delve into the specifics of these reports and whatnot. It's a very well cited um, article here, very comprehensive, goes into each sporting event, um, the dosages, exactly what was, you know, the performance metrics that were enhanced from it and by how much. And it's just a very, very interesting read. So, but with that being said, the performance enhancement regimen that is of note that I wanted to delve into here, which uh, really piqued my interest, was the 30 milligrams of T ball per day with um the uh testosterone but you have to keep in mind too like that's they're saying per year like for all we know the cycling practice that they use that's even if you just average it out over the year it doesn't mean they used it for 365 days straight they might have you know cycled off and bridged and you know used a higher dose for a more you know condensed time frame which is you know a likely scenario but they just give the dosage for the entire year but it's really interesting that they delved into that to begin with and you can just divide it out and kind of extrapolate for yourself and figure out what you think they used. But if they did it over the entire year, that's what the dosage came out to. And it's, um, you know, like, I guess if you condensed it down, you probably have dosages closer to, you know, like 60 to 100 milligrams per day, likely in some of the blast phases. But with that being said, you know, a lot of this is up for interpretation and is a bit extrapolating just based on these uh, kind of vague time frames, like yearly dosage outlines. But it's still super interesting to see what was done in this time frame, the logic behind the choices of drugs, the uh, applications of them in different sporting events, which genders were given what, and the dosages given to each and why. All very interesting stuff. So if you want to check it out, it is called Hormonal Doping and Androgenization of Athletes, a secret program of the German Democratic Republic government. And the full article is entirely free. You don't have to like buy it or anything like that. And you can just find it by typing it in. And it should be one of the first links on Google. So check that out. And um, yeah, good read for sure. Thank you guys for watching. If you want to support the channel, you can like and comment. Helps the algorithm here. Follow me on Instagram at moreplates underscore more dates, Facebook, Snapchat, BitChute, Twitter, TikTok, Apple Podcasts, wherever I am. If you're listening on audio, if you can drop a five star rating on the Apple Podcast, that is very much appreciated and it helps the algorithm there. And if you're not on Apple Podcasts, I recommend you subscribe so then you can listen in the car without burning through your data and your battery. Because listening to YouTube videos in the car or at the gym or anywhere, especially if you have spotty Wi-Fi, is not only risky to your data, but to your battery life. <laughs> and if you want to support the channel with anything I'm associated with, it's in the video description below, my TRT clinic. If you are seeking uh, telemedicine-based TRT, it's very convenient from the comfort of your own home. You get all your bloods evaluated by a qualified patient care coordinator 
from the comfort of your own home. And then from there, you can talk to our doctor over Skype, FaceTime, Zoom, whatever you want, and uh, get medications prescribed that are, are medically warranted should you be uh, you know, somebody who would benefit from sort of hormonal intervention or some sort of therapy that has to do with optimizing your health. I recommend you check that out. If you are interested, uh, you can save $50 off your first treatment with the coupon code MPMD50. If you want to support the nootropic and pre-workouts I developed, Gorilla Mind, Gorilla Mode, Gorilla Mind, nootropics are best for um, focus, productivity, creativity, pretty much anything that requires having your brain just locked in, essentially trying to get your, uh, most productive work done in as, uh, I guess, maximizing the hours in a day, getting, you know, 16 plus hour work days done is not easy. It's very difficult. And usually people are brain dead by the eight hour mark. But with Gorilla Mind, it's not unheard of for people to be pushing 12 to 16 hour work days of high quality, productive, creative work. And it's what I use personally to grind through university and cram for, cram for exams and stuff like that, which I don't necessarily recommend, but it certainly does help. So, and in my working years now, this is what I use to help me uh, push through my work days. And the pre-workout formulas, obviously self-explanatory, but those are just check out the formulas. I could encourage you to pull out your current pre-workout, just compare the label to mine, Gorilla Mode, our stimulant-based pre-workout, and uh, Gorilla Mode Nitric, our stimulant-free product. Both are top-notch in the industry, in my opinion. It's pretty transparent why. Just check out the labels and you can see for yourself and um i think you'll be happy so i'd recommend giving them a shot uh seeing how you like them and um, they taste good too considering the ridiculously potent formulas i can't don't even understand how we managed to make it not taste like ass but they don't so bonus on that too so anything else i'm associated with too video description below thank you guys for watching talk to you soon